Okay, everybody, we'll, we'll get started here in a minute. We're going to talk about workflow today. I'll go ahead and get things started. We're going to talk about accounts receivable, and when I say that, I'm talking about sales type transactions really is what I mean. Because if you go into other softwares, um, sometimes it'll be a fulfillment module or an orders module. Sometimes we'll call it accounts receivable module. It's just the transactions that fit into that area. But we're going to talk about workflow today, about reasons why, why not to, when, uh, because all of us know, well, probably a lot of people on the call know how, how do I create an estimate? How do I create a sales order? But maybe not the why. Why should I? Why should I not? And we're going to be talking about that a lot today. Uh, as always, if you missed any, whoops, whoa, if you missed anything, you can come check out our YouTube channel. We do have playlists in YouTube. If you haven't seen the playlist, um, then it gives all of our series that we've been doing, I think for almost a year now. We are about, I guess I should throw, throw a slide in for this. We are about to um, schedule our what's new for early, early September. Um, so we'll be doing the what's new in a three-part series on this series, but we'll also do a what's new webinar separate, which will be an hour and a half. Oof, a lot of training because um, there are a lot of cool things coming out. Uh, we do also have our Facebook group, Four Lane QuickBooks Enterprise Facebook group, if you feel like connecting with your peers there, asking questions. Uh, if you are sick of calling into its support, please make sure to give us a call and we can make sure to help you out with that support. I saw a support ticket the other day and it was uh, talking about when you go to the no company open screen or whatever, right before you open a company file, there was no company showing there um, when they installed on a computer. So it's just simple things like that, that, oh my gosh, if you had to sit on the phone for four hours with support to get to the answers to that, it'd be very frustrating. So we're here to help with that. Um, today, I am joined by Lori and Kat on our team. So they're gonna be helping us work through some of these questions. Um, what we're going to be talking about today. So when to not to use estimates, when to not to use sales orders, when to not to use sales receipts. I would love it if any, if somebody used sales receipts, put it in, if you put it in chat or a question mark, if you use sales receipts, I'd love to hear what type of business you're in. And then maybe just straight to deposit, not using any of these sales type transactions. And of course, I'm going to spend most of the time in products when we're going through things today. Uh, so, if we can kick things off with Lori, mm -hmm. when would be a good time for somebody to consider using estimates? What would be a trigger for them? Like, hey, this happened in my business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so usually when they tell me they're having to keep up with their estimates in Excel, that's one, right? They're wanting to keep all of the, the steps that they're going to do, maybe what they need. Um, because they either don't know they can use estimates or they feel like they're not ever going to move forward with them, like there's too many, right? They, they may not all get accepted. That's one. Another one is if they, if trigger words are usually, I need to know, you know, estimate versus actual. I need job reports. I need to know, you know, how to compare. Many times we can start with an estimate and they can actually, it'll trigger those, like the estimate versus actual reports. I have a client that they are very heavy in, um, you know, their jobs, like each customer has multiple jobs attached to them and they didn't have a way to separate those out. Being able to see what the estimated detail was, even on summary, but detail was their big one. And so we were able to start with the estimate and then it triggered for them to be able to pull up each job to see where they were. Very cool, I like it. How about uh, Kat or Lori? Yes, but Kat, if you, do you have any clients where you have gone in and said, you probably should not be using estimates? Uh, let's see, so I've had some clients that were using estimates or even one client right now that's using pending invoices instead of using a sales order. So whenever we need that, you know, workflow, whatever that kind of pre-invoice workflow transaction is and needs to 
be committing inventory. Um, and they're using an estimate and wondering why it's not working. Mm -hmm. um, or using a pending invoice <laughs> and saying, I can't see what, you know, my orders that are coming in. That's a that's an indicator of when I say, well, we probably should not be using estimates. We should probably be using um, sales orders. So a lot of more, um, some of my more like retail customers, right, they're not using estimates. They're using sales orders instead. So it's just still a non-posting transaction, but it works a little bit differently. Uh, with the impact on the reporting side. Yeah, like e-commerce e seen that too. Sorry. Sorry. Well, I was going to say e-commerce seen that too, where they don't need an estimate per se. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If we, if we have an e-commerce store and they only sell online and they have estimates mm -hmm. enabled, then that would be something for us to say, wait a second, why, why are you doing this? Right. Because in e-commerce, right, guys, the e-commerce is all after the fact people buy online and we're fulfilling so there should be no quoting because the website's quoting for us mm -hmm. on our behalf that's good so this is a good place to come into your preferences to see what's enabled not and en not enabled right sales receipts we're going to talk about a little bit estimates if they're on or off sales orders on or off i saw something the other day when i was doing a detailed setup of uh, quickbooks file and um it said I chose the wholesale distribution, um, and it said for wholesale distribution, the default is to have inventory turned off, which I thought was weird. Because <laughs> if inventory is turned off, then payroll, I mean, uh, purchase orders are turned off. Mm -hmm. um, and so that doesn't fit with wholesale distribution for sure. Um, and then also it had sales tax turned on, which usually wholesale distribution also doesn't have sales tax, right? So. But getting back to here, so we were talked a little bit in there about, I didn't even think about pending invoices in, in this discussion today, so maybe, maybe we might need to throw that extra one in here. <laughs> um, but, but, um, what about, when? when is a good trigger for people to decide that they need to use sales orders, to enable sales orders? Mm. That one's an easy one. If they're doing inventory management, sales orders are helpful. <laughs> Yeah. Why is that? Um, so if you go and use the, which is, I mean, I deal a lot with manufacturing and, and inventory clients, right? But if they use that inventory stock status by item or vendor or site report, as long as they've got their sales orders in and their purchase orders in, plus, you know, some of those other pieces like min and max, this report is super helpful by, autom well, it doesn't automate it completely, but it definitely automates it a bunch as far as getting that information in there. But it tells us it drives the requirements because of the sales order. And that's important. So you know what you're going to need when. So even if, so inventory is a trigger. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't have the inventory in your house, meaning you do it through a 3PL or Amazon Fulfillment or whatever it is, it still is your inventory. It's still yours. It's still an asset. You still need to be able to see and utilize reports like this to see how many you have on hand, how many you have on sales orders, et cetera. Um, uh, you know, it still is helpful to be able to see these kinds of things. Uh, what about... Uh, times when, Kat, how about for you? Is, is there any other trigger that should be yes, use sales order? Yeah, so I think if we have clients that are, you know, doing fulfillment kind of outside of, um, like outside of QuickBooks, right? Like they're just like in that e-com, right? That's a great example, right? That's coming across, maybe it's coming across into QuickBooks as an invoice or sales receipt, but they want to be able to move fulfillment inside of enterprise, right? And using some of the advanced inventory features to do that, then that's where we would say, okay, well, we need to switch it, right? That integration so that those um, orders come in as a sales order so that we can do that fulfillment in QuickBooks, right, with using sales orders to do that. So like tracking it through the process. Um, and so I think your next question is probably going to be when we don't use sales orders, right? <laughs> so <laughs> um, that would kind of be when the, the reverse of that is true, right? Like maybe they have a 
third party that's doing fulfillment or um, orders like the client that actually just got off the off the phone with they're like yeah we don't we don't need to know when it's coming we we um, we need our order to be in there right away and we're gonna plan to deliver that within a couple of days so there's not going to be the situation and we're also not ordering um, they, we're not ordering product based on our orders like we have our reorder points right. set and so we don't need to know like what's coming down the pipes because we should be able to fulfill everything so that's where they're going straight to an invoice maybe a timing thing mm -hmm. a timing thing could be important um, still still good to track it as inventory right because it, then we know we can right. help help to hold accountable our drop ship warehouse so it's still good to track it as inventory but maybe just go straight to invoice and we do there are some tools out there right there are some softwares that will connect like even a lot of web stores will connect into quickbooks and they will uh, go straight as a sales receipt as you said or as an invoice there are there are tools though that will allow you to go in as a sales order like webgility mm -hmm. um, so you can and it's so it's a choice uh, with that I like it I like it um how about uh how so for me to like I always tell people it's it's allowing for people to do multiple steps so similar to when we receive an item receipt we talked about this last week in our meeting we have an item receipt and then we have a bill that allows us to have the warehouse do their piece and then the bill allows accounts payable to do their piece um, and so having an estimate and a sales order is kind of similar. It allows salespeople to do their thing. It allows warehouse to do their thing. And it allows AR to do their thing, right? So separating out duties and giving people responsibilities and accountability for what they are responsible for. Um, it helps to build in that complexity uh, because if we just go estimate to invoice, as an example, then warehouse doesn't have anything to say like what I'm being held responsible for. I talk about that too, building in, sometimes building in complexity is important, right? And giving everybody their own roles and make sure that we have the appropriate uh, workflows and audit trails to, to uh, hold people accountable to. Mm -hmm. What about sales receipts? So I know that this one is, it comes standard on the screen. A lot of people just leave it there and they just see it on the home screen. They never use it though. Um, you know, you can go in and turn it off just like you can anything else. We can uncheck the box here and, and take it off of our home screen. But when, what would be a trigger for someone to decide to use sales receipts as opposed to invoices? Uh, Kat, why don't you go ahead and start with that one? Sure. So um, when I've used sales receipts with clients in the past, it's because they have, um, I like to call it cash and carry, right, where I'm going to pay for these goods or services and I'm also going to leave with those goods or services. Mm -hmm. So that exchange is happening at the same time. So it can make the workflow easier because the sales receipt is basically an invoice and a payment in one transaction. So we don't have to create an invoice and then go in and receive a payment. We can just record a sales receipt to say this person left with these widgets and they paid me $500 for those widgets and then move on with our day. Okay. So it lowers, so where, where that's especially effective would be uh, if we, so we have some clients who do, right? We have some customers who come to us and they say like, I create an invoice and then I receive a payment against the invoice and that is happening immediately right I create the invoice I receive the payment I create the invoice I receive the payment on every transaction so that's time having to do that where sales receipt would eliminate that time to have to do multi steps especially if timing is the payment is happening on the same day it also eliminates uh, file size right because if you receive a payment or if you create an invoice and it has one line on it that's two lines for if it's a, a inventory transaction then you receive a payment against it, it adds two additional lines. But if you do it as a sales receipt, it's just the four lines. So it'll lower your transaction count too, which could be 
helpful for these uh, large file sizes that we see all the time. Um, Lori, how about you? When have you seen, what has been a trigger for you to, to say to somebody, hey, let's use a sales receipt instead of an invoice? Um, when they're using QuickBooks as kind of like a point of sale instead of point of sale, because um, it's like what Kat said, they're coming in, they're picking up something, taking it with them. Um, they don't need all the extra lines. They don't need all the extra info. They just need to be able to print something that says, hey, you know, I paid for this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've actually got a couple of clients that um, they were going through. Some we do go ahead and create the sales order because they need that to drive. But if, if for those that don't, we've got two clients or the, I have two clients specifically that they just needed something to get them in and out the door, but they didn't want to do point of sale. So one thing about a sales receipt that a lot of people don't know is you don't have to choose a customer. You don't have to put a customer on a sales receipt, whereas an invoice, you have to put a customer. Mm -hmm. um, so if we're just talking about um, to another another one that, that we'll see is in the web store world, we have some clients, they, they go web store, their workflow is web store to CRM and then CRM to QuickBooks. And so the details of the web store purchases are maintained in the web store, right? And clients, their clients, our customers' clients, can log into the web store and see all their transaction details if they need to. Details are maintained there. CRM has some stuff in it too. Sometimes the orders go over to CRM in detail as well, so we can report on them there. But what comes into QuickBooks is summarized. And so um, we'll use sales receipt for summary information, utilized, right? Um, it's just easier to deal with um, so we'll use it for like the week of sales or the you know what was what sales what inventory was used this month um, so more summarized information usually I know I tend to send them to sales receipt do you guys what do you guys think about that mm -hmm. I do same yeah I do the same is there any, would there be any reason for us to use an invoice? It's, an invoice would just be more train, more transaction steps, right? Or as a sales receipt, we just receive it in a, into a deposit clearing account. So, mm -hmm. okay, that makes sense. Um, so can you tell me about a client that you, a client situation where you, um, Lori, we'll start with you mm -hmm. this one where you had to use sales receipts and invoices. Like what, yes. was, what was the customer situation for that? Yes, so I have one that they actually have a couple of web store, you know, e-com stores. So those we, I mean, it made, we had it set up so those would come in as sales receipts for them, but then they also have a, a custom division where they had to create um, custom projects and they needed to know when to order, how to plan, you know, to schedule. So those we did, um, we actually went estimate versus the two sales order on those because it was timing on how to keep up with them. But it's, it was almost like two separate divisions. So we had to have those kind of set up as two separate methods to get that information in the system. Fascinating. Very good. Kat, what about you? Have you had to workflow build in sales receipt and invoice? Yeah, so when they have um, both, which I think is what, like Lori was saying, right, when they do have some customers that have terms and they have some that are cash and carry, um, sometimes I've also built in sales receipts when we're using those sales receipt transactions for um, other usage, like internal usage of inventory for like an R&D project, as an example, right, where we're going to you they're not using sales receipts they don't have any customers that don't have terms they don't have cash and carry type stuff happening but we want to be able to track you know maybe some inventory that we're using for research and development purposes for a particular project right? it just gives us another way to track it then we can sell that inventory just at a zero sales price so we record that it came out of inventory we're still capturing that cost but we can also see how much cost is going into that project um, as a whole based on how much inventory has been used for it. Um, so sometimes we'll just use sales receipts for, you know, they're not using sales receipts in the traditional sense. So that's just another um, transaction that we could say, okay, well, we're going to use it for this specific purpose. So I like that too. And I, I've done that with people 
before, especially for internal projects, right? Because people go, oh, but I'm not going to bill the right. sales department <laughs> for these items that they're utilizing. But so what we can do is you can go in and set up a price level for internal, give it a fixed percentage and say it'll decrease item prices by 100%. Right, so it takes them to zero. So sales price is zero, but it'll still pick up the cost. And then that way, when we go into run job profitability reports, we'll still see the cost showing up for these things, even though we're not generating revenue on them. And the, even further, to be able to filter on reports would be to set up the customer, when you set up, you know, ZZ internal customer, to say, uh, so I always do it easy because then it goes to the bottom. If, you guys, if anybody's not heard me say that or doesn't know why I said that, <laughs> watch a couple of these webinars. But it's easy because then it shows at the bottom of your customer list and it's not, you know, mixed into customers and confusing people. So you see it's easy, so it goes all the way to the bottom. Um, but then we could do uh, like customer type and have a new one called internal, right? So then we could filter customer type off the of reports just to look at internal jobs for things um that's also i like that that we pick it up as being internal um i've also done sales receipts for customers who have fixed bid on projects um so what they'll do is like they have they'll bill based off of a schedule let's say so they have you know it's going to be $100,000 projects. We have five $20,000 payments that are due, and we'll reflect that on the estimate. And then the invoice, the customers just see a $20,000 payment. That's all they see on the invoice. Um, but then on the sales receipt, what we'll do is we'll use it as like an issue ticket. So anytime a part is being used on the job, and, and I think we did an issue ticket by month by job for them, so it would be tracked appropriately. It would be the 100% off because um, there is no, or I think actually we set their items up as $0 sale price because they didn't sell individual parts at all, but we just wanted to show consumption tied to the job. And we didn't want to confuse the AR people and have them accidentally send out an invoice to a customer that showed like all these details. So we did it as a sales receipt. We rebranded it as an issue ticket. Hopefully that makes sense, what I was just saying. If anybody has questions on that, let me know. Uh, I do see a couple questions in here, so let me pause for a second, get to the questions, and we'll go to our last one here. Um, so uh, Vivian said, is a sales order the only way you can print a pick list? Lawyer Kat, you want to take that? Well, I've, yes, but I've also created one in QBAR. So for end product, it is a sales order, but I have created one because we had a special need for a client that they needed to be able to pull the assembly components out, right, without creating a, a group for one and then, you know, it, having to do multiple sales orders for the same order. So we were, we did come up with one in QBAR. So QBAR has one as an example. Um, a pick list or a packing slip Right, these are just templates. So you can actually flip, like if I had a sales order open, here's my sales order. I can flip to pick list, print it, and then flip back. That's also a solution. And then also pick list is just a report, really. I mean, really it's just a report. So you could also build a report that you run. And so like, let's say it's sales order detail, Whatever, some kind of report in here and we get it and we make it all the way we want it to look and then we say okay view I'm gonna add this to my icon bar and this is my pick list report and it's more for like today what needs to be shipped today maybe you have it filtered down that could be also something um, Rebecca said can you use a sales receipt for example as a deposit on a large order invoice takes out of inventory once you create the invoice you may not want to have stock taken out at that moment uh, and then somebody Judy also asked the sales receipt adjust inventory the same way as invoice do so it's kind of the same question um, uh, so a sales receipt as far as how it treats inventory is exactly the same 
as an invoice. So if you put items on a sales receipt, it is, so if I take this one um, and I say save and I get all my pop-ups <laughs> uh, and I go to my um, transaction journal, it's going to treat it exactly the same as an invoice would treat it for, for adjusting inventory out. Um, however, we do had we did do a video on um, how to treat customer deposits, right? To actually use customer deposit as the item, which would be like an other charge item, um, and then that way you're accepting the sales receipt. It goes against their your liability account, the customer deposit account. So we have a video on that if you guys haven't seen that yet. Make sure I'm not hitting missing any questions there. Okay, how about um, when, okay, so, I mean, we, I know obviously everyone, I mean, not everyone knows, but most people know the workflow of creating an invoice, right? That's what most people do is create an invoice, receive a payment. Um, have you guys ever had or coached someone? So, Kat, I'll start with you. Have you ever coached someone to bypass all of this junk entirely and just go to record deposit? Because you can record a deposit straight to sales. Right. Where's my mm -hmm. income? There it is. So have you, when would be a time that somebody decides to bypass all transactions in accounts receivable and go straight to a banking type transaction to record sales? Sure. So oftentimes it's for clients that are not like carrying inventory right inside of um, QuickBooks. So they either don't have inventory as part of their business at all um, or they're not carrying it inside of QuickBooks directly. Um, which we kind of talk through why maybe they should. <laughs> but also, um, oftentimes, a lot of my um, nonprofits will go straight to deposit because they have, um, like, donor uh, websites, apps, et cetera, that are collecting donations. And so what they need to be able to show on QuickBooks is not, you know, Sally Smith donated $500 to this specific um, you know, for this specific purpose, but they just need to know the total of all the other people out there that donated and what they, how much they donated to this specific purpose. We can also still use class, which is something that's heavily used by uh, the nonprofits that have worked at this well. So that's just an example of how, because they're tracking all of that donor specific information in that outside system. That outside system is doing what they need it to do. They can report and run metrics on it and all the things. So we don't need to clog up their enterprise file with duplicative data, right? That data is in that outside system and there's no need for us to have that detailed data in QuickBooks for their workflow. So we just go straight to deposit. I heard there. So don't need item detail, but it's not only that don't need item detail. I think I think what, what we would say as a company to our clients, like you need details, right? The more details you have, you might not need to look at them all the time, but it's good to have it set up for when you need to look at it, you can look at it. But if you're looking at it in another system, mm -hmm. then that's okay, right? But if you don't right. have that data anywhere, right, we need to put it somewhere. Exactly. Lori, what about for you? Have you had to ever coach somebody just to go straight to deposit? Yeah, I've got um, I've got one nonprofit that like Cat does that they use another system, so it's okay to. I mean, they don't they have the data somewhere else, but we all, I have some attorneys um, that use that too because they just need to be able to document it to the you know it's a retainer balance, so they don't need anything other than that. Um, so they just kind of let the bank rules handle it, moving it in there and just keep up with the names. So then, of course, it has to be okay with being a cash basis company, mm -hmm. right? No receivables, unless they're doing some kind of adjustment at month end um, to, to push it to a accrual basis. Mm -hmm. um, so I heard nonprofit in there quite a bit. Um, I'm, try I'm trying to think of any that was not nonprofit. I think that we've had we've had some people in the in the um, restaurant industry. I'll see it a lot of times where it'll go. Usually, it's what you're saying, Lori. Well, they just where they are doing the online banking and it syncs across, and they just accept the sales deposit as whatever revenue account that they go into. So it it turns it into a deposit, but they don't actually see it on the screen unless they double click and open it up. Um, I've seen it also frequently in like uh, doctor's offices 
medical practice, med medical practices where we'll just show the cash receipt because their insurance billing program is keeping track of everything somewhere else. And because of HIPAA, they don't want all the details in here anyway. Um, so there's a couple of examples. Okay, we're over time. Oh my gosh, that went by so fast. I hope everybody was able to, whew, uh, I'm looking out my window talking. Uh, I hope everybody was able to take away a couple nuggets. Thank you, Lori and Kat, for joining us today and having this discussion. And I hope everybody has a great rest of your afternoon. <laughs>